Welcome to those watching online. It is always good to be together and to gather around the truth of God, of who He is revealed to us in Jesus Christ, and to be shaped and transformed by the Spirit of God who indwells us. And so I want to, I want to read, um, wait, before I do that, I want to just share this. <clears throat> the greatest danger, someone said, that the church faces is undiscipled Christians who have been overly informed by culture and under-informed by Scripture and the Holy Spirit. Very good, that. I want to read to you the portion of Scripture that I'm going to base this on. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 12 to 20. So just listen here from the ESV. All things are lawful for me, Paul writing says, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by any of them. Food is meant for the stomach and stomach for the food, and God will destroy them both. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord and will raise us up by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one with them? Because as it is written, the two will become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one with him. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body. But the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God with your body. Excuse me while I try and find this. I'm having a little problem with this little program, but it won't be long before it's rectified. Thank you. I want to talk to us today, if I can have that slide shot, thanks James, about a better theology of our bodies. So I began last week when I spoke about the highway of holiness, and I spoke about this body and having a better theology of the body. And um, I, I just think we as Christians don't always understand the role of this body, the way God sees it in Scripture. So today, and one could also talk about it as faithfulness with our bodies. We've been entrusted by God with this body. And what does it mean to be faithful with this body? When I talk about body, I'm talking about your human beingness. Your humanity, this complexity of spirit, soul, and body that cannot be compartmentalized, that cannot be separated from each other, but are interwoven and somehow be, become one thing, your humanity. We as Christians live in a, well, let me say this, we live all in a fascinating world. There are events that happen that I get so excited about in the world. And there are events that happen that just leave me a little bit rocked, a little bit shell-shocked. But my shock levels are sadly dwindling as youthful idealism is replaced by middle-aged reality. And I start to expect less of what I hoped for when I was 15 and 16. Because it's a fallen world, although beautiful. But I want to say the following. That the value of human life, of the human soul, of the human being, is under threat. It has always been under threat, but it just keeps accelerating forwards where it, it's like, what do people think of other human beings? 
What do we see when we see another human being? The value of our human body, our human body, is under threat. As the world in general kind of advances towards greater equality in human rights, like better gender equality, which it has made a lot of advances on in the last 10 or so years, it still reels with radical tension, like we're seeing now unfold in Afghanistan, like we have in our own country, like we have in most countries around the world. This underlying evil in the human heart to do harm against another human being, this underlying problem of evil that has been there from the beginning, which necessitates us needing help from the outside because we can't help ourselves. Yet, as human rights is the buzzword in the corridors of our post postmodern society, this on the ground value of human life still remains under threat. Take road, I mean, road rage, I just, it, it's the most crazy thing that. And a human being will stop and shoot. And kill somebody who they've never met before just because they drove badly, according to them. The value of human life has become what? Lying is off the charts. I mean, I listen to the Zondo Commission every now and again. In front of the acting chief justice, you just lie. That wasn't me. I didn't know anything about that. Lying is off the charts. Sexual immorality and infidelity is off the charts crazy. The world is changing and continues to change at such a pace, yet we try and fight for human rights. The question is, what kind of world do we want to live in? What kind of a world do we want our children and our children's children to grow up in? Because we've got a part to play in that kind of world. Back in the days of my youth, it was considered a little bit weird, like you're a little bit different if you didn't have sex with your girlfriend. Nowadays, it's actually viewed as there's something inherently wrong with you if you haven't had sex with your girlfriend. There's something bad about you if you haven't done this. There's something wrong with you. You're broken if that's not how you're doing it. Some of the justification is, well, you wouldn't buy a car without test driving it, would you? Yes, that's right. Compare the value of a human life with a piece of metal and some rubber tires. The value of our human bodies, our humanity, has shrunk to something so small and little. But while human rights buzzes around, there's this thing called moral relativism which just kind of knocks against it all the time all the time it's this ongoing fight moral re relativism is like that thing well you you able to decide what you think is important based upon your context and your reality because I'm outside of your context so therefore I've got no right to speak into your life so you determine what's good for you I mean, who am I to impose upon you what I think or feel? Who am I even to share that with you? You do you. You be free to be you. Speak your truth. Who am I to judge or differ with you on opinion? Intellectuals, far from God, come up with these terms and phrases and make them very popular. The, the post-modernist and the post-post-modernist, whatever you want to call us, we say everything is relative. There are no absolutes. Have you heard that before? Okay. Which, ironically, is an absolute. <laughs> the current worldview embraces moral relativism. It's a worldview where it's up to the individual to decide what is right and what is wrong and what is acceptable and what is not. 
You de- and we get to decide whether we want to agree or disagree with tradition, with what our parents say, with what God says, what the scripture says. We decide. Could it be human rights and steroids? But yet they fight each other in the corridors. And because of this, we get to decide everything. We get to identify with who we are and who we want to be. We get to decide how we think based upon what? Based upon how our heart feels. Based upon how our heart feels. But to follow your heart, you assume too much. Because you assume there's no confusion in your heart. You assume there's no hurt. You assume there are no contradictions. You assume too much. Can you honestly trust your heart? (laughs) Well, the world has tried that and where has it got us? What is our moral code? Follow your heart. It will guide you. Yeah, right. It's a world that's hurting and fractured and broken because we've just followed our hearts. Surely we need assistance from somewhere else, somewhere outside. Enter Jesus. Enter Jesus into the planet to show us that your heart will lead you astray. There's only one who can be trusted, and that is God Most High. And here I am to do His will. Here I am to live the life, the life of the highway of holiness. And I'm going to invite you into that life so that your life will be different to all others. Enter Jesus, the only one to have ever mastered life. And He says in Hebrews 10, as I shared last week, a body you have prepared for me a body thank you father a body you have prepared for me here i am to do your will not whatever my heart feels to do here i am to do your will he takes this body that he has that he so beautifully stewards on planet earth for 30 odd years he stewards it till around the age of 33 Living out the will of God that blesses and brings life and value and correction and truth to others around him. And then he takes this body and he says, with his disciples around at the supper table, he says, this is my body broken for you. I'm going to give up this body for you. He says, whenever you eat like this, I want you to remember what I have done for you. That you don't have to live like the world does. He says, no greater love is there than for one person to lay down their bodily life for another. He's using the body to accomplish the will of God. And purposes of God. He's using the body, the human body he was given, to demonstrate the power of true love. The body is an integral part of the demonstration of the kingdom of God. As I said last week, the body is the interface of the kingdom of God within and the world without. The body is the thing, the vehicle that Jesus used to bring the life of the kingdom into this world of brokenness. The body, a body you have prepared for me, here I am to do your will. You see, there is a fundamental and radical difference to the way Jesus lived, to the way the world does. He never ever lived saying, it's about me and it's about what I want to do now. It's about what feels good to me. It's about what my heart's telling me to do. He always walked in tune with the Holy Spirit, as Ray was talking about. With the Spirit of God within him, saying, God, what is your will for these people right now? What is your will for me right now? And he brought the kingdom of heaven into this world via his body. He didn't come as a disembodied spirit. He came in the flesh. 
And he lived this highway of holiness, as I, t- as I spoke about last week. A, a road higher than other roads walked by people. A road where the life of God within flowed into the world around him. And he has invited us into that life. And whoever is born again is by grace positioned in that highway of holiness. You're invited to have this highway of holiness within you. And from within you, that kingdom of God life flows out. But you can look, listen to last week's message if you want more about that. But we Christians do life differently. And we do relationships differently. Why? Because of the highway of holiness, because of the kingdom of God within us. Holy is not a moral word. Holiness doesn't make you better than anybody else. Holiness just means a life lived differently. So, for example, in the temple in the old days, you, you would have a pot. And the one pot was used for a particular use in the temple. It made that pot holy. It didn't make that pot better than the pot next to it. It just made it different. It was used for something particular. Jesus said, my body is used for his will. Yeah. That's what holiness is. It's just different. And so, 1 Corinthians six twelve to 20. Did I do that? Should just be there. 1 Corinthians six twelve to 20. The two preceding verses talk about the kingdom of God from what I've just read. Remember what I read in the beginning? The two preceding verses are speaking of the kingdom of God life and how we access it and how we live in it, how we have it as our our inheritance. So it is the whole theme is still this highway of holiness and the body. So the body is the interface of the kingdom of God within and the world without. As I said last week, I cannot live my Christian life on planet earth without this body. Now interestingly, Corinth, this letter that Paul wrote, was obviously in Greece. um, And it was about 80 kilometers south of Athens. It was in an area where Plato had popularized and familiarized his philosophical theories which were a lot of it was a lot of dualism it was a lot of two parallels that run in life there is my 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 human soul reality that is much higher than this earthly bodily reality the things we touch and experience around us And so the Corinthian church would have been largely influenced by the platonic thinking of that day. And Paul is going to address this directly in the most wonderful way. And so here it goes. You people say, this is now, this is really my understanding of it, which is what it's, what's written there, but it's good to help us talk about it like this. You people say, because of the philosophical thinking, All things are lawful for me. But I say, not all things are beneficial for us. You people say, all things are lawful for me. Of course, they've come to understand grace now as Christians too. All things are lawful for me. But I say, let us not be dominated by anything. Because you'll give yourself to something and it takes you further down the road than you ever intended to travel. So though I can do all things, not all things are good for me. Paul goes on to say, you quote the philosophy of your day. You see, because some of these things are things in inverted commas you'll see in the Bible. You quote And you say, live to eat, eat to live. Food is meant for the stomach, and the stomach is meant for food. Food is for the body, and the body is for food. And they're both going to be destroyed anyway. So why don't we just eat, drink, and be merry? That's what he's going after. You say, I can do anything. You say, I can just eat anything, because it's just for this. And this is going to die, so let's just get gluttonous and let's just drink ourselves into a a place of merrydom and have fun. 
That's what you say. But he goes on to say this. And, but he goes on to take that analogy of, the, of food is for the body and the body is for food and they're both going to be destroyed. He goes on to say, but now I'm going to take that and I'm going to extrapolate that to teach you a higher truth about sexuality. So all of this flows, but I want you to notice it flows from the body. Food for the body, the body for food. But let's just pause there while we're talking about food for the body and the body for food. Because if this body is so important to God, which we're trying to get an understanding of the theology of the body, like I shared last week and like I'm sharing today, you'll see how many times body is mentioned in that portion of scripture. If the body is so important to God, don't, don't, don't bow down to the, the, the dualistic thinking that the body is evil, it's of the world, it's just going to pass away, it's, just, it's nothing. I want you to lift your understanding of the body. It's the vehicle by which the kingdom of heaven comes to earth. It's the body that God has given me, Jesus says, that I say here is your will. So when it comes to what you put into your body, and you, you and I and everybody needs to understand this, that if you want your body to do well, you've got to steward your body well. Don't think of it as a less than thing, and it's the spirit that's the grand, ultimate reality. Without your body, you cannot take a step on planet earth and show love to another human being. Without your body well, you are incapacitated. Without your body, if it, just, if it dies, your Christian life on planet earth is done. That's how important the body is. So when it comes to the body, don't just think, oh, it's going to be destroyed one day, so I'll just eat and drink. That's what the philosophy of the day was. Paul saying, no, 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 no. Your body is more important than that. What you eat and what you drink has a bearing on this vehicle to bring the kingdom into the world. If you eat badly, if you eat oils and just carbs and just meat and you don't exercise and you drink too much and you do and you drink sodas all the time cokes all the time or you drink too much alcohol whatever it is you are actually not honoring this body you're thinking it's it's of the earth it's useless it's a waste of time and jesus said but a body you have prepared for me thank you god for this body i'm going to use it to do your will friends this body is what i've been gifted with by god I don't have another option. Neither do you. It's what I use to live out the spirit life on planet earth. This is it. So I go, wow God, this body you have given to me. May it be used for your will to be done on earth like Jesus said. I believe deeply in caring for this God-given body that houses the Holy Spirit. And what I put into this body, how, how it rests, how it sleeps, how it exercises, what it eats, what it drinks, has a bearing on my ability to bring the will of God into this planet. So now listen to this. You say food for the body, the body for food, but they're both going to be destroyed. But I say the body, Paul says, is made for the Lord and the Lord for the body. That there is a theology of the body. Right there in that scripture, that is everything you ever need to know about your human body. The body is made for the Lord. And li listen to this. And the Lord is for the body. Wow. If you and I will get that, we will start to live differently in the body. That's how Jesus lived. A body you have prepared for me. This body is from you, Lord. And you, Lord, are for this body. And I will lay down this body for the sins of the world. So, wow. The body is for the Lord. And the Lord takes delight in and pleasure in the body. He's for the body. So, 
So here it is, crossing over to sexuality. Paul says, you feel you are free to pursue whatever you desire sexually. Because he says, what I say, um, the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord. And the Lord for the body. That's the context of it. So now he's crossed over to this sexual thing. From food for the body to our sexuality. The highway of holiness is where the body is lived out as unto the Lord. And we live as if the Lord is very interested in and committed to our human beingness. When I say body, I'm not just talking this thing. I'm talking about the complexity of soul and spirit and, and body. Everything. What we call body. Paul goes on to say this. He says, And, you, and God raised the Lord's body. Even though it died, God raised the Lord's body and he will also raise us up with new bodies. Can you see how important the body is to the Lord? It's not gone. The new heavens and the new earth is where we have bodies again, but recreated bodies, glorified bodies, not organic bodies, but it's still a body. The body is for the Lord and the Lord is for the body. He goes on to say this, Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Not your disembodied spirit, your body, your human body is a member of Christ. You have been joined to Christ in your body. And he has a body of a whole lot of bodies. We all together make up the body of Christ. And we are connected to each other. And how we interact with each other. And what we do with this body has an effect upon everybody else. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Your body was created with the same dignity as our Lord's body. You've been made one with him in body. And in spirit, of course. Paul says to sleep with a prostitute, is to take the body of Christ because you're connected to the body of Christ and to join it with a prostitute. And he says it shouldn't happen like that. And a lot of us sit here and go, Phew, I'm glad I didn't do that. But let's just think about our sexuality. If the body is for the Lord and the Lord is for the body, that means everything about me in my humanity is for the Lord and the Lord is for me. So whatever I do, in, my, in the sexual arena of my human beingness is either glorifying and flowing in unison with the highway of holiness or it's fighting against it. It's either like the world or it's different from the world. That's what holiness means, just different. And Paul says, whenever I indulge myself with, in any other way, Outside of the covenant relationship that, that God has blessed for the expression of and the experience of beautiful sexual intimacy. Anything else outside of that is not honoring the Lord with your body. And it's actually, he says, you are injuring your own body. It is detrimental to your human beingness. When you do anything else outside. God is not a killjoy. God knows what's good for us. And the soul is most blessed. When it's in covenant relationship with one other human being. For the two become one. Notice what Paul says. There. He says we think oh, it's husband and wife when your whole soul connects. And Paul says when you go with a prostitute. When you have sex with somebody else. The two become one. There's something much more significant than just. The, the outside organic body connecting. It's your humanity connecting. It's your soul connecting. It's more than that. Sexual intimacy. Okay, let me, let me quickly go here. The union of people through sex. I want you to hear me now. Is deeply spirit and deeply soul and deeply body. Always. No matter how much you try and deny it, that's how we were made. When you say yes to sex, 
you are handling another person's soul. And he who is joined to the Lord becomes one in spirit with him. So Paul says, flee sexual immorality. He just understands the dynamic of what's going on here. He has a man who never had a marriage relationship, but he's understood this theology of body and that this is for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And when I do something sexually, it's more than just an outside physical experience. It's a human beingness experience. That picture is of Joseph throwing off his cloak with Potiphar and fleeing away. He then goes on to say this, and I want to just reiterate this. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body. Lying, stealing, whatever you want to go with. Coveting, anything else. Um, just being swearing at somebody or losing your cool with them. But this thing about sex, he says, you're sinning against your own body. It's deep. It's deep. You need to understand that. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Your body. Your human being vessel. Spirit, soul, and body. This whole thing is where the Holy Spirit comes to dwell. The Holy Spirit dwelt in Jesus, His body. And He interfaced the kingdom of heaven through that body with the world. Same with us. You and I have received, if we believers, and we've been filled with the Spirit, we have received the same Holy Spirit in this body. Have a good respect and love for your human beingness because God loves it. It is the vessel you've got to show the world His love. You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God with your body. It's a good theology of body. Some people think, well, my spirit man is beautiful, so it doesn't really matter what happens beyond that. No, God says, no, your whole human beingness is a gift. Glorify the Lord with your human beingness with your body what we do anyway, Christianity's view of, of the human being stands supreme it's not like Plato's Christianity's view of the human being is you are magnificent all of you that God has made like I said last week your flesh is not evil it's just weak you can't trust it. You can't put confidence in it. You can't boast in it. But it's beautiful to God. Christianity's view of the human being is most magnificent. What we do with our sexuality may just be one of the most precious gifts we can give to our broken world. That we view it and do it completely differently to the way the world does. A precious gift that we pass on to our children and our children's children and we help people to get healed. i close with this. The followers of Jesus, having been graced with a body that is inexorably joined with Christ's body, we are bought with a price. So let us offer our bodies, like Paul says, a living sacrifice. That's it. Here I am to do your will. And you wake up every day and you go, God, thank you for this body. That's why God loves to heal your body. Have you ever thought about that? That's why he loves to heal your body. That's why he still heals bodies today. Because he wants you to go, here I am, Lord, to do your will. Rock the world with an alternative way to live. Thrive in the highway of holiness. Enjoy a better theology of the body as we steward them to the glory of God, for we've been bought with a price. Let's stand together.